started this morning and as we start a little bit in the area of housekeeping and so on the board first of all midterm grades uh, for the first time in many years the school is uh, asking us to submit midterm grades for students and so those will be available I believe on Friday since that is when they are due now biology classes will have midterm grades that do not, do not reflect the lab portion of the class. Therefore, your midterm grade is based only on lecture. And so you know what your grade is at this time. If you have any questions about your grades, if you want to come and look at your test, you know that's still up there on the blackboard. Again, biology classes will not reflect the lab component, which is a major component here of your grade at midterm time. Also, I won't see you now uh, next week because of the spring break, so I'm wishing all of you uh, a safe and good spring break. Keep in mind that students never have vacations, <laughs> and so for me it's going to be a catch-up time, and it may be a catch-up time for you also. You know that this class requires a, a great deal of study time and memorization time. And then our next test, the projection for the next test. Today we're going to finish uh, Chapter 3 and start Chapter 4. When we come back after spring break, I am projecting I will need those two days to finish four and five. So the following Monday is the projected date for your next test. Yes? Am I not cold? Yes, but it usually this room starts off being very warm. Eight o'clock is just terribly hot in here. But then when they kick in the air conditioner, it gets very cold. Now, so, you know, bring a jacket, bring a sweater, something extra to carry around with you uh, with respect to this room. You know, I forgot to check the date on that, but it says spring break starts on the 12th, then the following week would be the week we finish, would be the week after that, that Monday. People, by the way, spring break does not start until the 12th. That means if you have Saturday classes, like a Saturday lab, those classes do meet this Saturday. Spring break does not start until the 12th. Other than that, uh, any questions as we pick up today with tissues and finishing <coughs> Chapter 3? Well, then I have a question for you. You do have a question for me, and that is, we were finishing class by talking about connective tissues. And when we look at connective tissues, there are major categories. There is a category called connective tissue proper. That category, in turn, is divided into two categories, loose connective and dense connective. What is the difference between loose and dense? What's the difference? It is going to be in the amount of what found in the matrix. The amount of fibers it has to do with the amount of fibers in the matrix. We did look at three examples of loose connective tissue. We did. Can you tell me one? Areolar connective. Areolar is the most abundant of the connective tissues. What's another example? How about adipose? Adipose is a second example. <clears throat> then the third example, reticular connective. Those are three examples of loose connective. So now we move into dense connective. <clears throat> and you have a picture uh, on page 95. As always, when they give you information about structure for the tissue, they also give you, within that circle, a location for that particular kind of tissue. So page 95, notice as you look at the diagram, the individual cells, these are fibroblasts. So we always talk about cells and matrix every time we talk about connective tissue. The cells are fibroblasts. And anybody tell me what that name means? It means to make yes, it means to make fibers. Blast means to make or to produce. And you learn 
that the fibers that are found in the matrix are produced by the cells associated with that tissue. So these are the cells, and also notice lots and lots of collagen, lots of collagen, which makes this tissue very strong. Notice, too, that the collagen runs in the same direction, which makes this tissue strong in one direction. We also, we also reflect that in the name. This is dense connective tissue, but because they run in the same direction, this is dense regular connective tissue, dense regular. <coughs> Did I tell you to think of collagen like a rope? Okay, so that is telling you, again, that with so many collagen fibers, very, very strong in that direction. Well, what kinds of structures are formed from dense, regular, connected? And so in your little picture, it says structures called ligaments and structures called tendons. By definition, what is a ligament? Connected tissue that connects what to what? Ligament, the word ligament means to tie. It goes from bone to bone. A ligament is connective tissue, dense, regular connective tissue that ties bone to bone. And a tendon is, again, connective tissue that connects what with what? Muscle to bone. Tendons connect muscle to bone. Now, this is the only picture that your author gives you for dense connective. So I'm going to use a transparency to illustrate the other two. And we just did this, dense, regular connective, and where's it from? From a tendon. Okay, notice here, this is really uh, very obvious. Lots and lots and lots of collagen, very few widely spaced cells. It makes it strong. Down here, this is dense, irregular connective. Again, lots of fibers, few cells, but notice here that those collagen fibers run in different directions. So it's going to make this kind of tissue very strong in many directions, not just in one direction. See the difference between this picture and this picture? Well, where do we find dense, irregular connective? Well, one place where we find it is that it forms covers over organs, like a cover for the liver, a cover for kidneys, the cover for bones. What did you name the cover that goes around the diaphysis of the long bone? What did you name that cover? Yes, periosteum. What does that word mean, peri, to go around osteo, the bone? That's what we named it, but what is it? It is a tissue. What tissue is it? It is dense, irregular connective tissue. Now, it is also showing you here another place where we find it. It says it is from the dermis of the skin. That's our next chapter. However, you can learn today that the skin is made up of two areas. The two areas of the skin are the epidermis, it is the superficial layer, and it is above, epi means above, the dermis. That's what the two layers of the skin are called, but what are they? They are tissues. They are tissues. Do you remember the tissue that forms the epidermis? I need something that is a covering tissue and that it is <coughs> protective. Many layers are going to be more protective than one. So not simple, but what's the word that means many layers? For epithelium. One layer is simple, many it's stratified squamous. Stratified squamous for this, and now you know this. This is mainly dense, irregular connective tissue. Just like we call it, periosteum is the name of the cover, but what is it? It's a tissue. These are the regions, that's what we call the regions, but what are they? They are tissues. You have to memorize your tissues, bottom line, you have to memorize it. And then the third example uh, of dense connective, can you see all the fibers in here? Well, what kind of fibers do those look like? Uh, the little squigglies. These are elastic fibers, the protein elastin. So this is your third example. 
It is elastic connective tissue. Where do we find it? We find it in the walls of very large blood vessels like the aorta. The aorta is the largest artery in the body. The big vessels are those vessels that are near the heart. And so the aorta actually comes out of the left ventricle. And when the ventricle contracts and it pushes blood out of this vessel, that's a lot of blood under high pressure. So this vessel has the ability to do what? To accommodate that high volume under high pressure, to stretch, to stretch. And not only stretch, but what did we say? To go back, so to recoil and to help move the blood through the body. So these are your three examples of dense connective tissue. So connective tissue proper, we looked at six examples, and they are divided out into loose and dense. The next, cartilage. Always cells and matrix. And so what do we call mature cartilage cells? Mature cartilage cells regardless of the kind. And there are three kinds of cartilaginous tissue. So regardless of the kind, cartilage, mature cartilage cells are called chondrocytes. Chondro means cartilage. And they are like osteocytes. And what are osteocytes? Osteocytes are bone. Osteo for bone. They are like osteocytes in that they sit in spaces within the matrix called lacunae. So three kinds of cartilaginous tissues. The first one is hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is the most abundant cartilage in the body. Therefore, if you ever have to make a guess, an educated guess would be hyaline cartilage. But really, it's easiest just to memorize the information rather than making guesses. I'm looking here at a lacuna, two chondrocytes, a lacuna, a chondrocyte. Okay. Where do we find this kind of cartilage? Well, I'm looking at the matrix, and I really can't see anything in the matrix. And so the word hyaline means glassy. There are very fine collagen fibers present, but they're not visible. We find hyaline cartilage over the ends of bones where they come together at a region called a joint. Smooth, glassy cartilage. The fetal skeleton. The fetal skeleton is not formed from osseous tissue, but it is mainly formed from pieces of cartilage. And those pieces of cartilage get converted to osseous tissue. Also, we talked about those C-shaped pieces of cartilage that support the windpipe. And what's the technical name for windpipe? That is your trachea. Uh, those pieces of cartilage are specifically hyaline cartilage and also as part of the respiratory system, the structure called the larynx. Common name, anybody? The larynx is your voice box. Yes, it is your voice box. And so you can look at page 439, but it talks about the larynx, and it tells you that the larynx is made up of eight pieces of cartilage. And those pieces of cartilage are hyaline cartilage pieces. So that is one kind. <clears throat> A second kind of cartilage is called fibrocartilage. So again, you're looking at lacunae with osteocytes inside, and now you can see collagen fibers. They're more obvious here. So this is the strongest kind of cartilage. Where do we find it? We find it between the individual vertebrae that make up the vertebral column. And what do we call these little pieces of cartilage? Inter, little prefix that means between, between what? Between the vertebrae. So those are intervertebral discs. They're formed from fibril cartilage. So lots of levels of collagen, so very strong. And the third kind is not in your book, so let me put up a picture. The three kinds side by side, hyaline, okay, 
smooth in appearance, matrix. Here, collagen, nice and strong, fibrile cartilage. And here, this is elastic cartilage. So what is the predominant fiber in the matrix? The predominant fiber is the elastic fiber. So we have elastic connective. We also have elastic cartilage. Where do we find this kind of cartilage? Well, this part of your ear that sticks out from your head that you can bend, and hopefully it goes back when you release that. You know, it bends and it recoils. That This is cartilage. This is all cartilage. Also, that structure called your voice box, the larynx, it has an opening. That opening goes down. It continues the passageway of air down to your lungs. And when you're swallowing food, then your airways are closed briefly for about a tenth of a second. And they're closed because there is another piece of cartilage that covers the opening. That opening is called the lattice, and that piece of cartilage that closes off the airways when you're swallowing food, so it goes down the digestive route, that little piece of cartilage is the epiglottis, like the little prefix epidermis, which means what? It's above. It's above the glottis. So it closes it off. That piece of cartilage is elastic cartilage. So mainly, uh, we're looking at highland cartilage here, but the little lid that sits over that opening is elastic. So three kinds of cartilaginous tissues. <coughs> osseous tissue. What's the common name for osseous tissue? Bone. Yeah, we're talking bone. So, bone is connective tissue, right? Connective tissue proper, cartilage, bone, and blood. So, bone is next. And this is on page 94. It's the very top of page 94. So, hopefully it looks familiar to you uh, from lab. <laughs> when we talk about osseous tissue, there are actually are two kinds of osseous tissues. They are compact bone and spongy bone. <laughs> now the names tell you something about these tissues. Which one is going to have more spaces in it? Compact or spongy? <laughs> yeah, spongy bone has more spaces in it. We're actually going to do more with osseous tissue when we get to the chapter on the skeleton system. But it is showing you here a compact bone. And so the unit of structure for compact bone in cross-section looks very much like a target. Uh, the entire unit is like a straw. And you have a bundle of all of these straws together making up compact bone. What is the name for this unit of structure? The whole thing, the whole straw here in cross -section. It is the osteon. So again, that little prefix, osteo, for bone. It's called the osteon. It has another name. It's also called the haversion system. That's a man's name. The man who first described this unit of structure was Clopton Havers. How would you like to have the name Clopton? Clopton Havers was an English anatomist, and so it bears his name. In the center, where you have the bullseye, that is a cavity. What do we find in there? We find blood vessels, lots of blood vessels, highly vascularized tissue. And then the cells, uh, whether it's this or this, the cells are still mature bone cells called osteocytes. And they sit in those spaces called lacunae. So in your picture, where you see black, you cannot distinguish between the cell and the space, like we could see on the pictures for cartilage. So the whole unit, this is the bone cell in the space. Notice that the bone cells sit in rings around that central canal and that between the rings, between the rings, here it's bracketed, there is matrix and that ring of matrix is called a lamella. That word laminate means layer, like if you laminate a sheet you put something over the surface of it, so between our uh, rings of matrix. Now what is in the matrix? Collagen. Collagen makes bones very strong, also makes bones flexible. And that's kind of hard for us to understand because we tend to think of our bones as not being very flexible. Actually, your bones are more flexible when you are younger and you have more collagen in your bones. 
So collagen makes your bones strong and flexible. What makes your bones hard are calcium salts that are deposited around those collagen fibers. But more on osseous tissue, as I said, when we get into the chapter uh, on bones. Blood is the last uh, connective tissue, and I'd like to start by turning to page uh, 337. puts us into chapter 10. Uh, chapter 10 is not uh, a chapter that is covered by lecture instructors. However, we do go into it for some information. Plus, in lab, you will also go into it for some information. This is not the first time we've been in chapter 10. I would like you to read uh, on page 337 over on the right side of the page. It starts off and it says, blood is unique. Bottom of the page, blood is unique. It is the only fluid tissue in the body. Although blood appears to be a thick, homogeneous, same throughout, the microscope reveals that it has both solid and liquid components. On the next page, top left. So this ties directly to our discussion on tissues. Since essentially blood is a complex connective tissue where we have the living component, we have cells, collectively the cells, meaning all the different kinds of white blood cells and the red blood cells, plus pieces of cells. All of these are called the formed elements, are suspended in non-living fluid called the matrix. And specifically, we call the fluid plasma. So, pulling together a lot of information from the beginning of the semester. Uh, what else makes this different? It says the collagen and elastin fibers that are typical of other connective tissues are not found in blood. However, there are protein fibers, and the protein is fibrin. In the word fibrin, you see the word fiber. And it says they become visible during the clotting process. And you have a great picture. It's on page 347. So unique in that blood uh, is a liquid tissue. And also, it does not have collagen and elastin. So 347. The very top of the page on the right uh, says scanning electron micrograph. Remember, remember, scanning electron microscopes give us nice surface pictures. And so you're looking at, at all those red blood cells being caught by a net. So it stops the flow of blood. And what does that net form from? It says this is a fibrin clot. Scanning electron micrograph of, blood, of red blood cells trapped in a mesh of fibrin threads and they're only visible during the clotting process. And then uh, back on page 96, this is what you have in the chapter. And uh, uh, this is kind of nice because it says this is a capillary and so what kind of tissue forms the walls of capillaries? I'm looking at one layer of very thin, flat cells. What kind of tissue is that? This is one location. It is simple squamous epithelium. And so pictures here a white blood cell and then your red blood cells. And over here actually names some white blood cells, and you should be able to name them for me using that little crutch, never let monkeys eat bananas, and then the P for platelet. So, cells put platelets give you your formed elements, the fluid is the matrix, and we call that plasma, it's mainly water, and uh, no collagen or elastin fibers, but we have 
fibrin fibers to form that mesh to catch blood cells. And in your book on page 97, all the way to the right, you see blood about in the middle. Another name for blood. What's another name for blood? Vascular, vascular tissue. tissue. Since blood or vascular tissue is considered connective tissue because we have cells surrounded by non-living fluid matrix called blood plasma, almost exactly what we read in Chapter 10. It says the fibers of blood are soluble protein molecules that become visible. That was the picture on 347 during the clotting process. It says blood is quite atypical when you think about connective tissues. Well, that finishes connective tissues for us. And so we move on to our next major category, our next major category, muscle tissue, which you see on the same page towards the bottom, big letters, muscle tissue. Nice reminder, it says muscle tissues are highly specialized. What's their function? Contraction, and this resolves in movement. We'll read through uh, the description in just a minute. But you know that I like tables. I think tables help students to learn information. And so this is a table that is on page 182. It is comparing the three kinds of muscle tissues for you. This comparison of skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscles. And it starts off as, first of all, where do we find these tissues? And so it's nice to be looking at tissues where you already know some of this information. And we have skeletal muscle tissue uh, forms muscles that attach to your bones, so attached to the skeleton, hence skeletal. And also uh, some of these attach to the skin associated with your face. And so when those contract, they give us our various facial expressions. Only place where we find cardiac muscle tissue, it tells you in the walls of the heart. And smooth muscle tissue, so smooth muscle tissue is found in the walls of hollow visceral organs, and then in parentheses, other than the heart. So it gives us a word there that we need to know. That word is visceral. Uh, you may be familiar with it, especially if you're a hunter and uh, you kill a deer, you kill a rabbit, you kill a squirrel, you eviscerate the animal. What do you do if you eviscerate the animal? Yeah, you re remove all the internal organs. So that's what the word viscera means. It means internal organs. It says, however, other than the heart. The heart is uh, in that category of internal organs, but it has its own tissue. Therefore, we can also call smooth muscle tissue visceral muscle tissue, which is good. Smooth is telling us that it doesn't have striations or stripes like these two have, and visceral is giving us location. And that is really good, isn't it? Because this is telling us by the word cardiac where it's located. This is telling us by the word skeletal where it is located. So the word visceral tells us where it is located. And then... Here are pictures of the tissues. The very same pictures are in our chapter that we are presently on. And then they pull out a single cell. And so this is a skeletal muscle cell. And it tells you that the cells are very long. They're shaped like a cylinder. They have many, many uh, nuclei. And they have obvious striations or stripes. And when we hit this chapter, we'll talk about what is responsible for producing those stripes. Because these cells are so long, they're also called muscle fibers. Remember, that word fiber should immediately tell you we're talking about something long. <clears throat> Cardiac muscle cells are similar in that they also have striations, but these cells are short and they are branching in appearance. So it says they're short and they form, they form networks of cells. The cells are usually uninucleate, they have striations, and they have something called an intercalated disc. So what is an intercalated disc? The very dark stripe up here is an intercalated disc. 
It is where one cardiac muscle cell joins another cardiac muscle cell and the plasma membrane of this cell is highly folded and the plasma membrane of this cardiac cell is highly folded and they form, in appearance, a very dark area. When you look at it, this is an intercalated disc. Well, what does folding do to surface area here between these cells? It increases surface area, yes. So what do we find here? We find gap junctions. What is another name for a gap junction? <coughs> you know what it is. What's another name for gap junction? It is a communicating junction. It is a communicating junction. And so when we talk about electricity in the heart, because these cells are able to communicate with one another so efficiently, when this network contracts, all the cells will contract at the same time. It's as though it is one big cell due to the presence of gap junctions here in this area called the intercalated disc. And uh, smooth, smooth muscle tissue, this is one cell, uses the word fusiform to describe the shape of the cell. That word means spindle. And so a spindle is thick in the center and then it tapers to the ends. Uh, these cells are also called uh, muscle fibers because they're long, not nearly as long as these, but they're long cells also. And then some information that we'll be talking more of when we actually get to this chapter. Down here it's telling you how fast these different muscles contract. And so the, the fastest to contract skeletal muscle is the fastest of the muscles. However, it gets tired more quickly than the others. The slowest to contract is a smooth muscle. However, it can stay contracted the longest of them. And then cardiac is right in the middle for both of those categories. Well, let's back up uh, uh, to page 97. Read about these in the chapter. <laughs> on page 97, at the very bottom, on the right. So skeletal muscle, uh, a tissue is packaged by connective tissues forming muscles, and these are attached to the skeleton. Uh, next page, these muscles can be controlled voluntarily. Uh -huh. It says the cells of skeletal muscle are long, cylindrical, multinucleate, have obvious striations, in parentheses is the word stripe. Uh, because skeletal muscle cells are elongated, uh, they are often called muscle fibers in italicized print. Cardiac muscle. So there's more detail uh, in Chapter 11, found only in the heart. Um, it says, like skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle has striations, but cardiac cells are uninucleate, relatively short branching cells that fit together tightly at junctions called intercalated discs. These intercalated discs contain gap junctions that allow ions, so when we talk electricity in the body, we're going to be talking ions, to pass freely from cell to cell, resulting in rapid conduction of the electrical impulse across the heart. Cardiac muscle is under involuntary control. What does that mean? It means that we cannot consciously control the contractions associated with our heart. Smooth muscle over on the right. It says smooth or visceral muscle is called this because no striations are visible. The cells have a single nucleus or spindle shape. Smooth muscle is found in the walls of hollow organs like in the wall of your stomach, the wall of the uterus, blood vessels. As smooth muscle contracts, the cavity can get smaller, so there's the word constriction. Oh, or it can enlarge, the word is dilation. So two, two good words for us, constriction and dilation. Then uh, looking across the page are your three muscle tissues, the very same pictures that were in the chapter with that table. Then the last tissue is nervous tissue. And uh, your picture's at the bottom, so let's take a look.
The nervous tissue forms structures like the brain and the spinal cord. When we talk nervous tissue, the cells that we will be talking about in more detail are nerve cells or neurons, plus there is a second cell population associated with nervous tissue. And the cells that make up this tissue are called neuroglia. There are six kinds. They have names. They have certain functions because these are called the supporting cells for the neurons. People look at the, the words neuro, neuro, is telling you that we're in the nervous system. Uh, this, this is a photograph and it is showing you, photomicrograph, it is showing you these are neurons and then many smaller cells of more numerous cells, these are your neuroglia. Looking at uh, structure for a neuron, uh, not a whole lot of structure, but some structure for a neuron. First of all, these cells are really cosmic looking. They're very interesting cells. Their structure tells you that they are involved in communication. <laughs> they have all of these processes or extensions associated with the major portion of the cell. And so the major portion of the cell where we find uh, a lot of cytoplasm, where we find most organelles, where we find the nucleus, the nucleolus, this portion is called the cell body. And you know from previous class discussions, when you see some, we're talking body, like in peroxisome, in lysosome, in chromosome, in somatic cell. So the word soma is the technical name for this region called the cell body. Uh, the processes have names. Uh, there are different kinds of neurons. Uh, however, all neurons have one extension called an exon, and then the number of dendrites, these ex extensions, can vary. So those words reflect the direction of information flow to and from the cell body. And since I can't tell, I just chose a couple <laughs> with arrows to show you. What, by the way, what is that electrical signal called? You learned it in chapter one. The electrical signal is the nerve impulse. That's what we call that electrical signal. We call it the nerve impulse. And so the arrow is showing you that the nerve impulse is moving along this extension towards the cell body. That would make, functionally, this process a dendrite. And then the arrow is showing you that information flow is from the cell body. Okay. Maybe to another neuron, or to a muscle cell, or to a glandular cell. And so information flow away is along an extension or process called an axon. Uh, neurons are different from neuroglia in that uh, they're able to actually initiate that electrical signal, and they have the ability to pass it on to another neuron, or again to a muscle cell, or to a glandular cell. Then the very last that will tie up our discussion on tissues uh, is on page 101. And on page 101, the topic is tissue repair. So on page 101 on the left, it is the first indented paragraph. So it's towards the top. It says tissue repair or wound healing occurs in two major ways. And so these are the two ways. Regeneration or by fibrosis. Uh, did we do the word regeneration in here? Or anybody tell me, like if a lizard regenerates its tail? Because I use that word in my zoology class. Lizards can regenerate a tail. Starfish can regenerate an arm. What does that mean? Yeah, they grow back with this. They grow back what they lost. They replace like with like. Hopefully, they replace like with like. Unless you have a sad situation like this. It happened when I tried to regenerate a new tail. <laughs> I borrowed it from my zoology students. 
Now, what's the sunny side of this? Isn't there a phrase that says something like, two heads are better than one? <laughs> so there is a bright side. But yes, regeneration means to replace what you lost with the very same. And so, let's read the two definitions here. It says, regeneration, in big black letters, is the replacement of destroyed tissue by the same kind. Fibrosis. Well, the word you see in fibrosis, fiber. So, we're going to replace what was lost with connective tissue. It says, fibrosis involves repair by dense connective tissue. We have a name for this. This is called scar tissue. So, if you're not replacing what was lost with the same, then you're going to have problems with function, right? Because you have affected the structure. So go over to homeostatic imbalance on the right side of the page. Same page over on the right. Homeostatic imbalance. Is this scar tissue is strong? Did we not say that if you have a lot of fibers, it makes the tissue strong? So the scar tissue is strong, but it lacks the flexibility of most normal tissues. Perhaps even more important is this inability to perform the normal functions of the tissue it replaces. Thus, if scar tissue is in the wall of the bladder or in the wall of the heart or some other muscular organ, is it going to affect the ability of that organ to contract? Absolutely. It says it may severely hamper the functioning of that organ. So that finishes the chapter for us. Again, you need just memorize your tissues. Memorize your tissues. It makes the rest of life in A and P much easier if you memorize tissues. And we're ready to move on. We're ready to move on to chapter four. So shuffle your papers. I'll shuffle my papers.